All right. Um, let me move on now to, as a, as a deputy ranking of the Lands and Forestry Commission, I am concerned about the use of state lands. Lands and Forestry Committee. Did I say commission? Leader, thank you for drawing my attention. I meant committee. I can't be ranking of a commission, so you should know I was referring to committee. I'm concerned about lands, especially the use of state lands. You will recall that about 12 appeal court judges and their families had to be relocated into rented apartments, costing at the time, we're told, not less than $2,500 a month with a promise to build them 21 ultra-modern replacement apartments in 18 months when a decision was taken to put up a national cathedral at where these 12 appeal court judges and their families were living. In fact, at the time, the information is that there were even some bungalows that were still under construction. The bungalows they were living in were less than, in some cases, five years old. I have also noticed recently that there's judicial service lands around the cantonments area near the Namibian High Commissioner's residence, where some, you know, um, judges were housed around Elwak. I've noticed that it has been taken up by private developers recently. Now, my question is, what will be your, and maybe related to this also are reports of the decay that we see at the recently constructed Supreme Court building. That's just less than five years old. Court the court complex, sorry, the court complex. What would be your attitude towards the preservation of these lands or assets or properties belonging to the judiciary? And do you know if those 21 uh, ultra-modern apartments that were promised when the 12 judges were relocated have been delivered? Thank you. Yes, they have been delivered. I actually live in one of them. And, and, and my attitude to protecting the assets of the judiciary will be robust. What does robust mean? I'm sure the viewers out there are also asking, what does robust mean? Madam. Robust means that I, as an administrator, I'll be absolutely interested in knowing where all our properties are. I'll be interested in knowing what is happening with them, the state of them, and ensuring that they are well protected because we need them. My Lord, can I ask this question? Does judicial service own any property? or their properties of the state are located for the use of the judiciary? I believe that these are properties of the state are located to the judiciary. But if they are located to the judiciary, then the judiciary must be in control of them. I understand that carefully, but I'm, I'm worried about creating the impression that it's the judiciary's property. It's a state property that state may reallocate to somebody else. I think that if the state is to reallocate them, it can only do that with our consent and our information. No, you, 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 I don't think that um, the, the state, because we are part of the state. Exactly the point I was seeking to make, because, I mean, this definition of what the state is, I know you know, will take us into another uh, realm of argument. But I hope that the chairman is not suggesting that the state refers to Hello, the executive. Please, please. That yes, can, go ahead with that your question. Can, that can offer land and take it at will 
and relocate you to anybody that they want. I hope that's if, not what the chairman If we get an opportunity, we will argue that between you and I, and I'll, tell, I'll show how. Because if I located it to you, I can't take it back. That is legal. Uh, please proceed with your question. Well, it looks like this debate has nothing to do with you, Honorable Nominee. But I'm on your side on this. And I'm hoping that you will actually ensure that land or property is allocated to the judiciary uh, are protected and used to the, to the benefit of all of us. And the executive should not encroach on it at will. Now to my next question. It has to do with career magistrates. It was um, something that many people in that area hailed. They were happy when it was introduced. At a point, a number of them were even given study leave to go upgrade themselves. And their promise was that they will be converted to become professional magistrates. As we speak, the concern I get is that many of them, one, many of them, have not been converted, even though they have undergone their training and returned, they have not been converted to professional magistrates. Some have been converted, but there's no criteria, there's no standard that ensures that it is monitored and it is based on merit. What will you do about that? Assuming without saying that this house uh, approves you to become the chief justice. What will you do about the faith of these magistrates who do not know when they will be converted to professional magistrates and even how they will be uh, converted? I know the House will approve me, thank you. But beyond that, I, 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 I think that all of these situations are covered by documentation. They are covered by records. And it's important to work with the records, the undertakings given, the actions undertaken, and how the stage at which whatever change has occurred um, is in. So I will work with the records. It, it, they, they cannot be conversations that anybody um, makes presumptions about. The records must speak to the situation. My final question. Um, I see that you are a person of faith. Membership with Aglo and all. And let me share a quote by Harold J. Berman in the Interaction of Law and Religion, where he writes, quote, unless people believe in the law, unless they attach a universal and ultimate meaning to it, unless they see it and judge it in terms of a transcendent truth, nothing will happen. The law will not work. It will be dead, unquote. Honorable nominee, I've seen you I've heard you quote Bible verses, including Hebrew 11.1. 1. Hebrew 11.1. 1. Quote, <laughs> quote, faith is evidence of things not seen, unquote. I've, 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 I've come across you make reference to that. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. That is believing something that cannot be seen or proven with tangible evidence. And I'm struggling to, 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 to contextualize that within the profession that you find yourself in, where we are told that evidence is everything. Can you educate me? I, 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 I can understand where you are coming from. It's, it's a favorite line I use when I am teaching on certain vision 
mission and goals, which is one of the subjects I teach, which is that we always start with something that is innate, our creativity, and then it's expressed outside. So that's what faith being evidence of things not seen means. There's something inside of us that comes out. But in the context of law, law is textual. And our duty is to interpret, construe it, apply it. That's why I said earlier that when I'm in court, I have my legal head on. When I'm at home, I have my faith head on. But in, I never lose my Christianity in both arena. So there's no case Thank where... Thank you very much. Where... Hi, chairman. Thank Chair, you very much. Mr. Chair, just a, a quick follow-up. Just for the record. Honorable Swain. Honorable Markin, may I give you a quote from Lord Denning? Being a lawyer, I'm sure you know of Lord Denning. One of the greatest... Uh, uh, just want to... Uh, no, I want to, I, I want to give him a quote. Oh, to him? Yes. Okay, before... <laughs> okay, he says he can't take the quote. So it's fine. If I'm allowed, then we can engage. Mr. Chairman, if I'm allowed, if I'm allowed so, we can continue to engage. But if I've been ruled out, then she cannot no longer be making references to me. Um, your, 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 she answered your question. You wanted to follow up. But you had asked four questions instead of three that has allowed everybody. You wanted a fifth option, which I, uh, I declined. That's right. But uh, uh, you... <laughs> Honorable Martin, if you don't mind, I'll give the quote to you before you go on. All, ex all experiences convince me, not only that God is ever present, but also that it is by contact with the Spirit of God that the Spirit of man reaches its highest and its best. This is a quotation from the Right Honorable Lord Denning in his book called The Closing Chapter. Yeah, Mr. Chair, um, it's in connection with a quote from uh, my respected colleague, uh, Suini. Uh, I mean, I think it was not complete. If you say faith is the evidence of things not seen and substance of things hoped for. I think that's a complete thing I just wanted to put. Thank you. Yes, Honorable John Kuma, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to specially congratulate Her Ladyship Justice Gertrude Araba Isabasa Kitokono. And I also want to use the occasion to pay special tribute to the outgoing 14th Chief Justice. Is that intended to be a question for the uh, new... <laughs> yes, new... it will finally end into a question. I'll, I'll be closely uh, monitoring. Kwesi closely monitoring. Yes, please monitor. Um, and uh, my question is on legacy. My <laughs> observation of... Chief Justice Kwasi Eniyebua's um, period as Chief Justice was his focus on expansion of infrastructure and new facilities, facilities for the judiciary. And I highly commend him for that. I know you as one of the boldest voices in the judiciary currently. And I'm impressed any time I read and hear your independent views on matters before the Supreme Court. A lot of people are looking up to you, especially our young girls. What, in your personal estimation, do you want to be remembered for as your legacy? Be taking over, oh, maybe I'm late, but okay. Yeah, unfortunately, you are late. Maybe I'm late he on that. Answered, he has answered that yeah, question. Okay, so... Let me ask another one. Okay, so the next question that I want to ask 
will be the, there is constant call on constitutional review in the country. And many of the concerns that, uh, especially non-lawyers who have called for constitutional review in Ghana have said that the president is too powerful in the 1992 constitution. Of course, as a lawyer who has seen so many clawback clauses in the constitution, I don't agree with that position. But because I'm also a politician, maybe people think politicians have different assessment of issues. Please, what's your independent assessment of the role and power of the president in the 1992 constitution? Will you call for an amendment of the 92 constitution because the president is too powerful? Thank you. I really would not want to share any views on that subject, except in relation to the judiciary. I notice that in Article 146, the process for removing a judge starts with a petition to the president. I do think that the work of the judiciary should not be cloistered in the hands, the originating, the origination of anything regarding the ju judiciary should not be cloistered in the hands of the president. So that if you have a president who does not want to remove a particular judge, and yet that judge's work is inimical, um, so far we haven't had any crisis, but I'm just thinking ahead. Um, it's only in that context that I think that we need to open up some of these um, provisions so that individual institutions can also have a say in some of the, in some of the issues that affect them in, in, in that context. But that's about the only thought I have. Mr. Chairman, just a follow-up on that one. That's your second question. Go ahead. Okay, thank you, Mr. Just, Mr. Chairman. Your Ladyship, many people have described that function of the President as only an accelerator. He is not even expected to have an opinion of that assessment. Do you agree with those who think that it's only a procedural role of the president receiving the petition and forwarding it? Do you agree with that position? Absolutely, I agree with it. But if he doesn't forward it, what, what can we do? Thank you, and I wish you well. Um, all right, I'll give you two. Aaron and two for Joe, I'll give you two. Two, please. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair, for your magnanimity. Your Ladyship, Araba Isaba Sakitokunu, JSC. Congratulations on your nominee, on nom you. your nomination. Thank you very much. I was enjoying, and I've been enjoying your submissions, your preaching, your eloquent quotations of relevant portions of the Holy Book. And I couldn't stop admiring that, that in your position as a lawyer, as a legal professional, and also a member of the upper echelon of the judiciary, your personal Christian views are publicly always upheld, and that I admire. In your earlier submissions to the, to the committee, your leadership, you made reference to judicial predators and indicated that in most cases where the activities of judicial predators had um, been encountered, it is very likely that nine out of 10 of proceeds from the activities of judicial predators may end up with the judicial predators, and only one may end up with judges. But do you agree that that may indicate 10% prevalence rate of the canker? Are you concerned about that 10%? And what steps would you take when your nomination is confirmed as Chief Justice of the Republic to address that supposedly or potential 10% prevalence and to address the activities of judicial predators? Thank you. Uh, yes, I'm, 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 I'm concerned about the 10% because we ought not to have um, any such um, situation. 
you know, a, a judge is supposed to be constitutionally, under the constitution, you must be a person of uh, good moral character and proven integrity. And so there should not even be any whisper. Um, that said and done, I, I think I've mentioned that judicial ethics is a subject that is consistently raised within our judicial training. Every, every aspect of our judicial training, we address the question of ethics. We robustly, we work on it. We work exercises, we talk about it, we have orientation on it, and um, we address it. I think also that, you say, you, corruption, as you know, is an, is an activity that, takes, that occurs away from everybody's eyes. And that is why perhaps the predators have a, a field day. Because who is to know what is going on? And, and so, to my mind, um, ensuring an active constitution, giving money to anybody, because justice is your constitutional right, is one of, it may be one of the um, most potent um, forms of addressing the matter. But beyond that, um, I, I think that there would be there would be sanctions available to address any errant behaviour. And for me, it is about always ensuring that whatever activities we undertake in judicial administration are regulated by law. You cannot tamper with anybody's rights outside of propriety and legality. Thank you very much. Your Ladyship, you also indicated further that you believe that the practice of justice is done in communities. And in that respect, um, I suppose that you believe also strongly that the wheels of justice ought to be running and running smoothly in every community most communities and equitably. Considering the current deficit of um, circuit courts and high courts equitably across the length and breadth of this country, what steps will you take to ensure that deficit is further addressed, considering that your predecessor did significant um, efforts on that recently? Um, he commissioned one a circuit court in my constituency together with me, and that is the first circuit court all the way from Adanse, Obwase to Yamransa before getting to Cape that long stretch. That is the very first circuit court. And I believe that, and many such courts were also commissioned, but there's still a bit <coughs> more to be done. What will you do to address that deficit in that respect? I think the studies that, are, that have supported the work that has been done under His Lordship and in Yabwa, um, the studies indicated 207 courts. They identified the need to build 207 courts. So far, what has been built is fewer than that. We've made a, a lot of progress, but we, we are yet to get to the 207. So I will meticulously pursue the construction of the rest and also um, ensure that anything that needs to be done to get them done is done. Thank you very much, Your Ladyship. I wish you the very best. And lastly, as a Christian and a lawyer, um, having indicated to us just in a short while how you've managed these two, what will be your professional legal position and your faith position on the matter of LGBTQ and the position of the law institute? I think I, think I have made it clear that when I walk into court, all my thoughts are soaked in the law. Yes. So, yes. We wait for the matter to on the law. Yes, yeah, so the law we make, she will implement. She will apply. I wish you the very best, Your Ladyship. Thank you. Yeah. Now I'm at leadership. Honorable Chief. Thank you very much, Chairman, uh, for the opportunity. Many of my questions will be public interest questions. I am not a lawyer, so 
uh, forgive me if uh, I don't come across as such. Uh, first of all, earlier some colleagues uh, asked you questions about, uh, at, at least to, to us ordinary people, the question of contempt of court, especially the Supreme Court, is quite a nebulous one because uh, we read, I have read, uh, severe criticisms of, for instance, the Supreme Court judgments in the United States, where even uh, uh, speakers described judgments uh, in quite severe terms, and we don't see anything. But it's as if in Ghana, people are ordinary until they become Supreme Court judges, and they say, look, you can't say that about Supreme Court judges. What exactly I don't yes. remember, that's not correct. Yes. Can you yeah, right. take that out of your... Which one is That they are ordinary until they become Supreme Court judges. No. It's not what you think. It's not correct. Please. Please. Honorable, let me guide you. What? Honorable Suvini, please. Okay, let me say it this way. I see ordinary people I know as lawyers, and the day they become Supreme Court judges, it's as if they are completely different human beings that must be treated. I'm saying, I know this is my view, why don't you allow me? Honorable Tesla, even when you were saying things about, about uh, Honorable Yanga, which were not factual, we allowed you to say Proceed that. with your question, no, please. Uh, you, you um, is it, is it, oh, no, you said she came to a by-election, but that's... And you corrected that right there and then. We have a right to do that. If you're, what you're saying is not factual. Is she actually the chairman currently? But if you mention my name and make an incorrect statement, then I have why a right don't you just it? allow me to make... Can I have some order here? You mentioned her name. You mentioned my name. Honorable, mentioned name Honorable name. Minister, please. I haven't given you the I floor. Leave my name out of your submission. I'll, I shouldn't give you the floor. I haven't given you the floor. Please proceed. Leave my name okay. out of your submission. Uh, your leadership, is it the case that when the boundaries of what contempt is are not quite clear, people are allowed to say whatever they say, and then you say that maybe within what you understand. Truth now you have gone beyond the boundary. Truth My question is this. Truth is no I can see that you are a scholar yes, because you've written yeah, books and you've done certain things. things. Will you make a commitment to perhaps help codify the, what you call contempt and describe the boundaries so that in the case that somebody is making comment. The person will know that you don't have to be a lawyer, but you know that this is the boundary. W would you help or give an assurance that there will be a way to codify what is contempt in this country? Because ever so often, your ladyship, we've seen, even colleagues, members of parliament, one person will say one strange thing about the judiciary, and in the eye of the public, he gets patted at the, at the back of his hand, and then another one uh, comes from the other side, and it's as if that person is treated completely differently. And I'm saying this, you know what I'm saying. I take the case, listen, listen. I take the case of the Muntier 3. And then Honorable, our own court colleague, Honorable Kennedy, a Japan. And as an ordinary person in the country, I ask myself, what, are, what, what, what is the balance? Why is it difficult for the court to come up with a similar, at least similar judgment? So that we know the boundaries. So that is why I said that I'm not a lawyer. So. If you answer this question, then you ask, uh, you, you tell me whether it is necessary for us to codify what contempt is, so that ordinary people know the boundaries within which we protect the sanctity and the integrity of our courts and the practitioners for our own good. That's my first question. Thank you. You know, the, the challenge of our work is that every case is fact specific. So you have myriads and millions of different sets of facts. And then we have sets of legal principles. And our job is to apply the principles to the different sets of facts. Sometimes the law that's applicable is in statutes, sometimes is in common law principles, etc. Sometimes is in 
regulations, different arenas of law. That's the challenge of our work. That's the, the skill we apply. And therefore, I, I can understand why you may be confused about why this and why not that one. It may be the facts of the case. I'm not vouching for it, but it may be different facts. In asking why the Supreme Court responds, I think that I had earlier indicated that we are custodians of 400 courts, judges, hapless citizens who are doing their best. And we must ensure that the administration of justice is not denigrated in a manner that is not allowed by law. On the issue of whether the law on contempt can be codified, I think that's a very interesting request. I will look at it. Thank you. Um, my second question is about uh, uh, another public interest. Recently, there has been a ruling uh, by the court. And on the 17th of July 2020, Joy, my Joy Online reported, and it was quoting uh, our colleague, uh, uh, the Deputy Minister at the time of uh, Justice, are saying that, for instance, birth certificates are not a proof of nationality. And this is a comment he made in relation to a ruling from the Supreme Court. When I take the form you feel to get a birth certificate, for instance, uh, they call it a birth regi registration form, form A. B, a, 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 a portion called B, particulars of mother. Under that, nine, it states a national of. So the mother has to state whether he's a Ghanaian or she's a Ghanaian or not. And then when you come to C, under that, 16, also, the father, you have to state the national of the father. When you come to the certificate that is issued to the person, it is quite clearly written the nationality of the person because the person has ticked the two boxes, the mother or the, the father is a Ghanaian. Therefore, he, he or she qualified to be a Ghanaian. So if today, the ruling, according to our colleague, is that a birth certificate is just a mere record of birth, what then? What then is a proof of nationality in this country? And I will be very happy because I see in front of me probably the most senior people uh, in, in judiciary in this country. And I think Ghanaians who are ordinary like me may want to know if I hold my Ghanaian passport, is it a proof of my nationality? Is my birth certificate a proof of my nationality? So I want to understand the understanding of that ruling why it is as if a birth certificate is not a proof of nationality. Meanwhile, on the form, you will have to certify clearly that you are a national before you are given a certificate as a national of this country. Honorable member, uh, honorable chair, citizenship is a matter of law. Nationality is a matter of law. Certain jurisdictions being born in that place makes you a citizen of that country. In our country, being born in Ghana doesn't make you a citizen of Ghana. It is your relationship with your mother, it is your mother's identity, your father's identity, it is your lineage that determines your citizenship. So, that form records, that form is actually an international requirement. We must know where everybody is born. That form assists to know your antecedents. But beyond that, your nationality is derived from the information on that form. It is not the evidence of your nationality. It is the beginning of appreciating how your nationality must be determined. 
It's an originating process. So if I hold a, 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 a birth certificate duly issued by a state institution in Ghana, Registrar of Births and Deaths, and it states nationality, Ghanaian, are you saying that that is not enough proof of the nationality of the, the bearer of that uh, uh, certificate? May, may I answer you this way? If you had an English person, come and live in Ghana and have a baby in Ghana, that person would have a birth certificate. But that person's record of the parents on that birth certificate would indicate that they are not Ghanaian. So the certificate is a record of where he was born. It is not an indication of the citizenship. Before it is said that in the generation, in the generation of the certificate, I quoted on birth, birth registration form from A, but B, particulars of mother, because if your mother is a Ghanaian, that that child, a child from that mother can claim. Honourable member, from the birth certificate, if your mother is Ghanaian. If your father is Ghanaian, then we can conclude that you are Ghanaian. But from that certificate, if your mother is not Ghanaian, your father is not Ghanaian, that certificate is a record that you are not a Ghanaian. So it is a record that allows us to... I, I am doing legal deduction. I don't know how else to express myself. <laughs> so can I use a birth certificate issued by the best and devs in this country the that says I'm a Ghanaian. Can I use it to prove my nationality as a Ghanaian? The birth certificate will never tell you that you are Ghanaian. The birth certificate records where you were born and the nationality of your parents. So the information on that certificate that says that my mother is a Ghanaian and my father is a Ghanaian, would that be sufficient to prove my nationality as a Ghanaian. No. It's sufficient to arrive at the conclusion that you are Ghanaian. It's the beginning point. Karen, your leadership. Your leadership. Your leadership. Can a Ghanaian passport holder use a Ghanaian passport as proof of being a Ghanaian? It's a travel document. I believe so. Because before you arrive at the passport, all your antecedents, such as the birth certificate, would have been evaluated. Okay. Um, by your, I mean, I'm saying it in a very respectful way. By your age, I don't know where my birth certificate is today. By your age, it is more likely that if you are asked to prove your nationality, you might produce your passport rather than birth certificate. Uh. How? Is that the case? Wow. Have my birth certificate. Yeah. Okay. What Mrs. Zuka, once she offered that she's got it, can can she produce it to me? Uh -huh. added, oh yes, to be added to the document. Yes, yes, Mr. Speaker. I did not ask for it. She, she volunteered. So if she can add it to the, the, the document, uh, we are. Let's proceed with your further questions. She's not a Ghanaian. I have. I have a, another question. So it's a very important document we should request. It's a very important document. Currently, in the, we have the three arms of government we have. We have 275 members of parliament. Chances are that we come from almost every corner of this country to represent the good people of Ghana. In the appointment of ministers, the executive, the president, takes into the, that into account and as much as possible appoint uh, people, ministers, and so from various parts of the country because it's enjoined to do that as much as possible according to the constitution. Public perception sometimes is such that there's, there's, there are sections of the public that believe when judges are appointed, especially judges 
of the higher courts, the spread of their locations from the country is not representative of the broad spectrum of the country. I'm just saying that it's a speculation. In the administrative the administration of justice, is it necessary to have justices coming from across the country? Because I know in parliament we say that the police, the military and everything should be a spread of the country so that even the way they do their work will be, will be uh, easier for them. In your view, do you think that in the appointment of judges, that spread should also be taken into account? I think diversity always enriches every group. And so if any group has different um, ethnic backgrounds, gender backgrounds, um, faith backgrounds, it's, it, it enriches the quality of thinking. In your early answer to a question about Article 71, uh, you rightly said that, indeed, the judiciary's uh, salaries or remunerations are determined as it is. it is for members of parliament. A committee is set up to review that after every four years. Indeed, um, you are probably paid something after the review, i.e., maybe you should have been paid 100 cities per month, but you were paid 40 cities. So when that commission carries out their work, they pay you something which is what you were supposed to have been paid at the beginning of the four years. But in your explanation, you said the public, uh, that you don't take ex gratia. The difference is, is that, the difference is that you are still in your job. The member of parliament actually terminates at the four years. If he is lucky, he comes back. But indeed, you are also paid something at the end of the four years. Is that the case? You can call it a gesture, you can call it salary adjustment, but you are paid something. Is that not the case? Everybody's salary is their legal right. So when you pay me less than what I'm supposed to earn, and later you tell me that this is what I should have earned, and you work out the difference and give to me. You are only giving me the balance of what I should have earned. What is the oh, In that case, are, Order, you, please. are you sympathizing with members of parliament and ministers of state? Since they are all accused of taking something they are not, they are not uh, entitled to. You cannot speak for them. Uh, I have, uh, these ones are uh, personal. I, uh, because of my profession, I noticed a news item recently that says that the court complex is in a serious disrepair. And indeed, when you go there, sometimes some of the floors and facilities are not fit for purpose. In fact, some of your courtrooms are on upper floors and your lifts don't work. I just wonder if a disabled person is seeking justice and the particular courtroom is on the third or fourth floor. How are you able to uh, provide justice to that individual if your lifts don't work? That's an excellent question. But the comment you made earlier about the decay, etc., you, you, you need to remember that that building is right by the sea. And so it's experiencing the effects of the sea. So it's about renovation and, and repairing of the effects of the sea. And that's being done. We are taking steps in every direction. They, these things are a cycle, and we, we, we continue to do our best. Now, I said it's an excellent, the question about the disabled person is an excellent question, because if someone has to go up to the fifth floor for a case, and the lifts are not working. That person is disadvantaged. So I think that the proper thing to do, and the thing that I really would hope the person would do, is to bring it to the attention of the law courts manager, of the chief justice, of the judicial secretary, of the registrar of the court, anybody in leadership that they have access to, that this is my situation. And then the case can be 
transferred to a court that is more easily accessible. Because there's only one high court, and every high court, I mean, the, so long as the parameters of the case can be heard in a, in a court closer to the person, that's the best thing to do. So it's just about giving information. The, this house passed a law uh, which is about disability. And that law allows the country to take steps within 10 years of the coming effect of that law to make sure that public buildings take steps to make them fit for purpose in terms of uh, people living with disability. That 10 years uh, passed maybe another 10 years uh, ago. Don't you think instead of allow, I mean, encouraging individuals uh, to contact court officers and other things, we should rather try to enforce this against a particular state institution who has failed to implement fully the, the provisions of the Disability Act and serve as a deterrent to others uh, uh, to, to take the necessary steps. You may be surprised, even Parliament may be uh, called upon to answer questions if we were to enforce that particular law. If you recall, your question was about failing lifts. And that's the question I answered. It's not that the building is not accessible, but it may be on the floor that's not accessible because of a peculiar situation. That's what I, and that's the answer I gave, that if there's a, a peculiar problem, it's important to respond to that situation. But so long as the building is accessible, I think that that building would have answered to the dictates of the law. Um, I think every institution must comply with law. Very grateful for that. And by the way, the, the breach of the law is not only on the upper floors. You could have a, ground, a building on the ground floor, and the thresholds do not allow people with certain levels of disability to assess that building. So I think the court should take uh, a look at that and see if they can help the various authorities to um, uh, implement the disability law. That would be very helpful to all of us. My Thank Lord, and can you, yes. Thank you. My Lord, did the judiciary obtain building permit before constructing that court complex? I will ask and get an answer. Because I assume that before a permit is issued, all the legal um, professional issues related to fit purpose would have been considered. So unless... Thank you. you Thank you for drawing my attention. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. I'm grateful for the opportunity. Let me quickly commend the nominee. Um, very impressive CV, and also to say that we are largely, I am convinced, as she's dealt with the overarching issues that and observations that members have raised, except to ask few questions. Honorable nominee, yes, what will you seek to do in your first hundred days in office? <laughs> Work very quickly on practice directions and manuals. That's very much on my mind. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Concerns about land cases, Honorable Nominee, has come up, your ladyship, has come up strongly in this country. And I heard your eloquent answer when you, you spoke to uh, three factors, technology, case management, and I think lawyers, if I'm right. And as I listen to you, it appears to me that the matter is more complex than it appears to most of us. And for want of a better expression, it looks like a coup de sac. Um, what, in your estimation, will be the way around this complexity? 
See, re reform is never a magic wand. You, it, it, it takes cooperation, it takes, very often we, we actually design programs and you f have to find the resources, you have to find the right facilitators, you have to do change management, you have to find uh, tools and devices for, for, for ensuring that the, the reform is incorporated into the way we do business. And so it's, it's, it's a process. Getting anything done is a process. And I do not have any blinkers on that anything can be done so quickly just by promising. Because I've worked in reforms for many, many years. And I've seen you have to think, start implementing. Sometimes you do user utilization records. You see that this is not moving as fast. You ask yourself, what other intervention? You set up subcommittees. It's a human process. Your Ladyship, we, we've all come to this conclusion that uh, ADR is a good concept to help us in the dispense of justice. And over the years, we've implemented it largely. in the practice of our uh, justice system? I think increased uh, communication on how effective it is. I don't think people appreciate that settling a case in you out of the court system can take you out of the court system. Instead of your system. being subjected to appeals for five years, possibly. Because once you, a case is mediated and negotiated and settled, there can be no appeal. So it's such a useful tool for dispute resolution. And I think that it's about communicating it and raising resources for it. And don't forget that there's also legality around what makes it, um, what, what makes a settlement out of court valid. And so the education must also go to mediators and to stakeholders. So it's about increasing education, it's about increasing um, resources made available, and it, yeah, capacity building. Your Ladyship, is it the case that um, education, as in its broader sense, is not being implemented in the context? Always media coverage. I, I recall the last ADR week was not um, was just a few weeks ago, no, less than two months ago. So th there's a lot of education, but there's more that can be done. Your Ladyship, this may be my last question on e-justice, and it's gratifying to to hear my sector minister say that she's ready and prepared to support in the execution of this all important. Uh, functionality. Um, so far, what do you think we are doing right? And are you going to add on in terms of any innovative uh, inputs in the practice of e-justice in our country? I, I was vice chair of e-justice to begin with and I'm the current chair, so that's what I'm doing. So, and what can be added on, in fact, there's a critical feature that we haven't been able to incorporate, which is um, affidavits, the swearing of affidavits, because the law requires that the one who's swearing must be, must, the, the deponent must be before the commissioner. Now, technology means that you may well be apart. And then the signature is verified. So we have to work on the technology of the signature verification and also the um, virtual meetings between the deponent and the commissioner for oath. So whenever we meet any of those critical um, gaps, we have to work on it. And, it, and don't forget that e-justice has been incorporated as a matter of contract. So 
we have a contract for this phase that we are working on, and so we have we have to develop the next contract to fill in the gaps that we we noticed. The my last question, your ladyship, um, so chair. I am an environmentalist, and I'm curious to hear your views on environmental indiscipline in our country. What, in your view, can the courts do to instill discipline in, in, in our environment and the way we treat nature in our country? I think we are all harmed by the way we treat the environment. It affects businesses coming into the country. Investors are not, but investors are loath to come into a place where there's the, the, the environment is not attractive. So all of us are affected. And the courts, therefore, are open to do what we can do. But don't forget that we cannot sit on cases that are not brought to court. So someone must originate the matter. If that someone starts a case and that refuses to continue with it, we cannot compel adjudication. You see, so the courts have a handicap. The independent nature of the courts is a big handicap for us. We don't, we, it's not even a handicap. We ought not to jump into, um, dispute into any arena. So sometimes people think that, people ask a question, can you see what is happening here? It's up to the citizen to bring a case to court. It's up to the attorney general to bring a case to court if it's, in a, if it's a criminal matter. And it's up to the one who is experienced to bring a case to court. And not just bring it to court, but follow it through. So Chair, just to thank the nominee, um, and also to wish her well. I'm grateful, Mr. Chair. Also very grateful. As honorable um, deputy rank, uh, sorry, deputy chair. <laughs> My lady, um, the name Tokolu. Which part of Ghana does it? It's an Anglo name. Okay, so where in Anglo state? Where does your husband come from? So if I want to be telling you where my husband comes from. Uh, it's on my name. It's my husband's name. <laughs> well, so, my lady, do I take it that you decline to answer the question? Which He's is from Asadame. I hope Where? I pronounce it right. Where? Asadame. Asadame, close to Chiamen, you mean? Yes. Okay. In the Volta region. Yes. So, <laughs> the name Tokonu is from Asadame. Which is a walking distance from Chairman. Yes. yes, sir. In the water region. Yes, sir. Which is part of the Keta constituency. Yes, sir. Okay. Where do you come from? That's where you come from. So you mean that is your husband's name? Yes, sir. That's your husband's name, you say? Yes, sir. Okay. My lady, um, so you are you are a fanti married to a, an unlaw man. Yes. Meaning that your your kids uh, will be a combination of fanti and gay, correct? Yes. Good. Um, now let me also ask you page four of your CV. Page four of your CV. You were trained by William Edem Fuga. 
Yes. Can you share some few thoughts about this gentleman who trained you? <laughs> you can share thoughts about death training. What you learned in law, but not the first, please. I think he was a sterling senior. I learned, I worked with him for 10 years, and I learned a lot from him. Clearly, as a person, you have no problem working with people of different tribes and ethnicity, correct? Correct. <laughs> Absolutely. I hardly notice anything like that. Yes. What is wrong with the question? Now, let's... How long did you stay at Fuga and Co? She said 10 years. She said 10 years. Later. From 19... 87 to 2000 to no 1987 to 1996 end of 1996 December 96 almost 10 years what influence your going to the bench I was invited by the then chief justice chief justice Aqua he was setting up the commercial division of the High Court, and he, he called me and said, would you like to be a judge here? And I said, yes, sir. All right, then that leads me to my next question, the Constitution. May we proceed to Article 144? So first, uh, 1441. So from the text, it is clear that the appointment of the CG emanates from the president. You agree with that? Yes. And then from 1442, you would agree with me that the appointment stated there too emanates from the judicial Council, you agree with that? The president acted on the advice of the judicial council. Yeah. Yes. So yes. therefore, yes. it emanates from the judicial council. In other words, until the judicial council so nominates, the president would have nothing to do with anything. Correct? It, 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 the appointment is by the president acting on the advice of the judicial council in consultation with the Council of State and with the approval of Parliament. My, 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 my lady, let's... Uh, you said uh, your, your <coughs> philosophy uh, is grounded on text. Yes. So maybe yes. let me read it aloud. There's other Supreme Court justices shall be appointed by the President acting on the advice of the Judicial Council yes. in consultation with the Council of State and with the approval of Parliament. So we'll pick it one after the other. Yes. So you are, the language in 1441 obviously is different in form and in substance from 1442. You agree with me on that? To say the other Supreme Court justices shall be appointed by the President acting on the advice of the Judicial Council in consultation with the Council of State and with the approval of Parliament. 1441 says the Chief Justice shall be appointed by the President acting in consultation with the Council of State and with the approval of Parliament. So what is taken out is the Judicial Council, the role of the Judicial Council. Yes, yeah, but if we pay attention to 1442 again, Are you saying that the president will initiate and seek the advice of the Judicial Council? I haven't, I haven't said anything. I'm waiting for your question. <laughs> yes, no, because my question was 1442, whether or not 
the, these appointments stated there too emanate, emanate from the president. No. I think you are asking me questions about the practical workings of this. And I would imagine that the practical workings of this may not fit squarely into this. I, mean, I, I don't know how the president starts the process. And um, the constitution gives us the structure. But the nitty gritty of it, that would belong to. Okay. No. My, my lady, let's, let's go practical. I'm not being hypothetical here. When my what, Lord. What exactly yes, is the question? Yes. Um, you see, when uh, my Lord Waman and my Lord Apao were appointed, you may recall that the Ganaba went to court. And when they went to court, they questioned why my lady Mensa Bonsu and uh, my lord, uh, the late, uh, oh, the man from the Mafusao, could not make it to the final appointment. And the position of the Supreme Court was that the Judicial Council, in making recommendation to the President, did recommend all these four. And the argument of the bar being that once it is done in, the, in a, a certain order of merit, the president was bound to follow the advice by making an appointment in that order. Therefore, since Mesa Bonsu, Professor Mesa Bonsu and uh, my Lord Mafusiao came before in that order, before uh, my Lord uh, Apao and Puaman, the president should have considered them first. So I'm saying that by that interpretation by the Supreme Court, 1442 was settled as to how appointment is initiated. In other words, it is not the president who initiates those. I mean, that's how I understood it to be. I want to know whether you agree with that. I, I suspect the structure of the ratio that you have put out may be slightly different from how that decision actually went. Mm. I, I want to consult with my... I was in court. I, I, I was part of it, so I, can, I remember I, I, clearly. I was not, so part, I can, no, I was no, not I, that, part of it. I agree, I'm not saying so. My, my lady, I'm not saying you were. You were at the court of appeal there. Mm. You were not there. You were not there. So I'm just giving... If Maybe you want, may want to consult yes. anybody. And that's why I said I suspect that the ratio may not be exactly as you're articulating it. So I want to clarify. If... My lords behind me remember the ratio of their decision. Well, you may do so. No, please. <laughs> uh, Honorable, um, my lord, my lord, you're not permitted to consult behind you, please. Then, then very well. Uh, I'm unable to, I'm unable not, to answer the know, question. That's, yeah. please, that's fine. I'm unable to, be, because the ratio of a decision is very important. And I, I, I don't want to uh, presume. Let's be clear. Has my lord read that decision? Very well. No. My lord, um, I brought this up because when we had the last voting here of my lord Jehu and others, some of our cons co colleagues uh, raised issues about unfairness, discrimination, and what have you regarding promotion to, to the Supreme Court. I therefore wanted your view, having regard to Article 153, which gives a clear list of the composition of the uh, Judicial Council. 
which has clearly a number of independent individuals constituting that body. And it's only four non-lawyers <coughs> appointed directly by the president and the attorney general. These, I would say, five out of the whole lot who may be Now, I just need you to, I just need you to give assurance to the public that having regard to Article 153 of the Constitution, really the major role played by the Judicial Council is key when it comes to appointment to the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court, and not solely on the President, so that the issue of discrimination, discrimination could be brought to rest. I understand your question. Yes. The, the, and from the way you framed your question, I can appreciate the angle of clarifying that the Judicial Council as a body is structured to have a lot of different voices. And we have a Justice of the Supreme Court nominated by the Supreme Court itself on it, a Justice of the Court of Appeal nominated by the Court of Appeal itself on it, a Justice of the High Court nominated by Justices of the High Court, two representatives of the Ghana Bar Association, a representative of the regional tribunals, a representative of the lower court, Judge Advocate General of the Ghana Armed Forces, Head of Legal Directorate of the Police, the editor of the Ghana Law Reports, a representative of the Judicial Service Staff Association, a chief nominated by the House of Chiefs, and four other persons who are not lawyers appointed by the president. And all of these people have to be part of the decision making. If that's the clarification you are seeking, it's evident from the content of the Constitution. Yes, exactly the point. So, should you become aware that there are very senior people who would have to be considered and feel discriminated against, would you take steps as a chair of this body to initiate processes leading to their elevation just to also make them feel fairly treated? As chair of the Judicial Council, the Chief Justice will definitely be privy to the whys and hows of all pro promotion. And I think that that's where I'll, come, I'll, be, I'll be coming from. All right, so let's go to the Judge Kwesin case. Um, in this ruling, the reasoning of the, of the, of the judgment is not yet out. But you consider the orders you issued to be executable orders, correct? And yes, right. And the affected party can either appeal, uh, uh, file a review of the decision, or perhaps apply for stay of execution. Now, would you agree with me that in the absence of the judgment, it will be difficult for the affected party to exercise certain rights in respect of the decision? Would you agree with me? I agree that the, anyone who obtains a decision from the Supreme Court is entitled to apply for review if they meet the threshold 
for review of the decision because there are very clear parameters for review. I also agree that without a copy of the reasons, it will be difficult for them to know. And so um, it's necessary for them to get a copy of the reasons. My Lord, a bit me on this, and this is for our collective consumption. You see, earlier my colleague uh, Ayariga raised an issue regarding this matter. We are the politicians. You pronounce on our conduct. And when there is ambiguity, there's confusion. To get our heads out of the cloud, we need certainty. Right now, Electoral Commission, which was a party to this decision, cannot act. The Speaker, who must exercise certain rights under Article 1125, may or may not act. I'm saying that though you have the right to pronounce or the matter and reserve your reason for another date, you may have to look at how you approach this or exercise such discretion in matters that are politically sensitive. Else, we are all trained, thrown into a state of confusion in sincerity. Because right now, you've made a pronouncement there, but that pronouncement that you've made, we've only heard it in the air. Is there an order? What of if the party will file a stay? What of if the party will file a review? Now, can the Electoral Commission immediately go and announce a date for uh, by election, what or if it does that, and the party, after receiving the judgment, decides to file. And you also are aware that in the recent case uh, that uh, you had lord a provision in that uh, narcotic act, my lord Professor Kote departed, moved when it came on review recently, was originally with the majority, a minority, and now with the minority. So it means that anything can happen. So I'm just drawing the attention of the bench to some of these things which could affect the... No, no, but that, that, that's, a, that's my, my, my law with respect. In the, in the case, let me refer. Which, which particular case? Case. You know that we are all we are dealing with the the matters the matters the, the matters that the matters that are happening. I believe that if we all get the opportunity to get it clarified, it will help all of us. But if it doesn't please Mr. Chair, I can drop it. All I'm trying to say is to draw your attention to some of these problems. Because you have said you have a discretion to reserve your reasoning for a later date. Thank you. I, I, what I said was that because of the nature of the panels, we take time with the decisions to make sure that every jot and every tittle is accepted by every member of the panel because all of us will put our hands to it. But the core content of every judgment is accepted by a panel member who says they agree. So the point you make is well noted. So in other words, the point I want to make is that the bench must be mindful of decisions that have political connotations so that you don't set us on a collision course as a political class. That's the point I want to make. Point is well noted. My lady, um, you were appointed to the Court of Appeal by President Mills of blessed memory. And according to you, 
the former late Chief Justice Akwa mentored you to the bench. And today, you are being nominated to the Supreme Court by Nana Adudankwa Akufuadu. How would you describe your career path within the context of these appointments? I was nominated while President Mills was alive, but I do recall that I was sworn in by President Mahama. At the time I was sworn in, President Mahama was, in, was the president. And I'm wondering, that, I'm wondering how to answer your question because you, 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 you mentioned different people who were key or who were in leadership at the time I moved to different stages. And then you said, um, how would I describe my career path? I think that my career path has been satisfactory. I have done my work. My work has been recognized and I, I have moved forward. I, I, I think I spent about seven or eight years in the High Court, another seven or eight years in the Court of Appeal, came to the Supreme Court, and here I am. I've just moved on after working for some time. So in other words, you, are, you have risen by merit, and there's nothing partisan in your career. <laughs> I, I would agree with that. <laughs> My lady, what is your view on, on, on death penalty? What's your view on that? As a justice of the Supreme Court, I'm mindful of the fact that when cases come to court, it will, if a case came to court, it would be my duty to preside over it. But on a personal level, I do think that the death penalty is too final. And it's something that I would be grateful if the legislative body can begin to look at it. My Lord, if I shot your daughter, it would be final, wouldn't it? It would be, but you see, in criminal law, we are always looking at the menstrual, not just the actus That is, that is that not the essence of a trial? That you take all the necessary evidence and circumstances and everything you want to consideration versus the law and come to a conclusion that I shot your daughter, intended to kill her, and I did Mr. kill Chairman. her, Mr. and therefore I'm guilty Mr. of murder. Would, not, would not that be how you would Mr. Chairman, come to With all due respect, order, 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 order 69. Order. Mr. Chairman, we are out of order. <laughs> Who has gone You're sharing about people saying we are quarreling. But I control the proceedings. Yes, you if you want that. to bring anything to my things, you know what to do. You don't know, not by speaking into the mic. Can this please hold on? My Lord, I was asking that if. Can you use another example, not my daughter? You see, Mr. Chama, exactly. Yeah. But, but that's exactly you the point. You shot Madam X. <laughs> well, not if I use Madam X, the emotional response will be different. So he who feels it knows it. So when we are arguing about their penalty being final and so on, it is when the shoe is on the other side. See that using your daughter's example gives a different feeling. That's all the point I want us to draw. I know you've done a good job. You've done a good job. very strong about that. An eye for an eye. Exactly. Yes, so.
My lady, let's. Uh, my lord, uh, let's go to the recent case of the Ezuami Manan versus Attorney General, where the law will pass. You had reason to strike out certain provisions. And you also admit that parliamentarians do a good job. Uh, when the memorandum comes, it goes through widowing committee meets, do the report, and eventually when we come to the floor, we debate, amendments are made, and we arrive at the final provisions of the bill, which is passed. Now, in view of what has happened, would you recommend a certain fusion, a certain fusion in terms of the relationship between the judiciary and Parliament when it comes to lawmaking, say that we can have a certain hybrid committee of a sort, which would have your input to, to look at some of these bills. Because my lady, you would agree with me that decisions of this nature <coughs> Much as you may be well intended and you may be right in your opinion, it doesn't augur well again also for the relationship that exists between these two organs of state. You see, we all have, we have different functions in the constitutional order. And these occurrences don't happen every day. They are very much the exception. And so, and, 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 and so I don't think that we should be setting standards around them, around exceptions. How exceptional do you think this is? Because there is a law that we pass as parliament. How, how do you see it as an exceptional How many situation laws have where... you passed this year? And how many laws, how many of them have appeared in court? Well, the point I'm making is that the regularity or the times when enactments and activities are brought to the Supreme Court, there's a wide spectrum that they do not um, match up to the constitutional standard. There's a wide spectrum. And we consider these within every fact situation. And the court, the panel that sits on it makes its decisions. That is our job. That you do your job, we do our job. And together we save the country. Yes. So you disagree with any fusion that would allow an overlay of relationship to help deal with some of these situations so oh, that absolutely. we don't create we, absolutely. We cannot problems we, of no, absolutely. Being, I think that if you keep your eye on the constitution and keep your eye on your own, everybody has their remit. Yes. Everybody has their remit, and there are good reasons for that. My lady, you are obviously an inspiration to women. You have, Thank you. You have uh, developed your career at the bar, you've gone to the bench, and now the Chief Justice nominee. If all goes well, you'll be sworn in. What have you to say? to women, young girls, who are in self-doubt about their own prospects in life. I would ask them to be confident in themselves, to work on the areas that create the self-doubt, to choose not to look down on themselves, to choose to appreciate that they are valued, they are persons of value, and, and that they are entitled 
to sit at the table. Every girl is entitled to sit with her brother at the table. That's what I would say. Mr. Chair, uh, nothing useful to ask again. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah they're all right. Yeah, yeah. Good afternoon, my lady. Good afternoon, the honorable member for Vejumako, where I went to primary school. <laughs> Thank you very much. Conflict of interest. <laughs> my lady. You are conflicted. My lady. Conflict of interest. <laughs> I notice on your CV that you spent some time to study in a Juma Kong. Uh, my constituency. And you did your primary school and middle school in a Juma Kong before you went to the Western Girls. So the people of the Juma Kong are proud. And they are happy you are to see that someone can <laughs> <laughs> okay. to that. You are claiming here. Thank you very much. However, uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> Edumakun has always produced people with Not integrity. Sure and we have Edumakun values that are often instilled in us. That will mean that no one can push you back. I hope and pray that you still have that values that you will not be a pushover. My values have been produced by all that have made me. My parents, my home, my schools, everywhere I have lived my faith. My lady, in a recent case, in the Supreme Court, in which, by a unanimous decision of five member, member panel, you were disqualified from participating in a particular case. And the case has to do with Ecobank Ghana, Securities and Exchange Commission, and the Ghana Stock Exchange. Correct? Yes. What were the reasons why you were disqualified? You know, I started my career in the commercial division of the High Court. And in the High Court, sometimes there were so many cases from one particular source against different parties. So this case happened to be one of those kind of cases where different parties had different issues in different suits. And I sat on one of them. So when the matter came out to the Supreme Court, I was very clear that the one I sat on is not this case. And so I refused to recuse myself. And that's how the disqualification question came up. So you accuse yourself, you failed to recuse yourself because you weren't sure that the case was bad. Sure. No, I, was, I, I refused to recuse myself because I was sure that what I had handled in the High Court was distinctly different from what was in the Supreme Court. My lady, on the hand side, could you have recused yourself when the objection was raised by the parties? I would not do things differently. My lady, so, you were at the High Court when the case was determined and you knew from day one that you were dealing with the same case. Absolutely not. I, I, that's why I, I, you see, in the commercial division of the High Court, it was easy to find a particular bank suing so many different people find a particular plaintiff suing so many different defendants. And I, I was quite clear that this genre of cases 
were very regular in the commercial court. And so they should not be an issue in the Supreme Court. I'll now take you to the issue relating to the ruling that you actually wrote, the lead ruling, in the case of Honorable Peter Amewu, the Hoho case. Madam, do you remember you wrote such a ruling? Yes, the, the certiorari application. The ex parte. Yes, I did. The review. The, the, the review. Yes. The Supreme Court, in respect of the Hohoi case, in particular, quashed the order of interim injection against the Honorable Amin, right? Yes. Yes. Right. yes. On the basis that only an election petition could the High Court invalidate the election of a member of parliament, isn't it? Yes. You wrote in the ruling. And if you are to look at the ruling that I have a copy here, I may refer to page 15 of your ruling. Page 15 of your ruling. It says, the validity of a parliamentary election and its outcomes must necessarily be prosecuted through a parliamentary election petition in the High Court. And neither the Supreme Court in its several jurisdictions and the High Court in its various jurisdictions have the jurisdiction to grant a relief relating to a parliamentary election without a hearing conducted via petition to question the elections of the High Court. Yes. Do you still stand by that? The, the distinction between the, the distinct features of that case that you have just read out of was the action was commenced as a fundamental human rights action. Then within the fundamental human rights action, questions regarding the validity of, a, an, of an election were raised. So what we pointed out, that's, and that is the reason why the orders relating to the validity of the election were quashed, because the validity of an election must be questioned in a petition, not in a writ. So the mode of commencing the action, the, juris the, the jurisdictional territory of the High Court, all of those were in conflict with the decision. And what we did was sever the invalid part from the valid part. Yes, that is the law. My lady, yeah. Most importantly, in the same case, you cited a case between involving Mr. J. H. Minister, the former senior minister, and I've read the judgment. You cited a case involving the senior minister, J. H. Minister. In that case also, the Supreme Court said that it did not have jurisdiction in respect of a parliamentary election. Isn't it the case? The J.H. Mensa case started out of time. That is how all the difficulties started with that case. And then it was also, I think, started, it was also started with a writ. So it had a lot of procedural difficulties. And then an aspect of it was brought to the Supreme Court on a constitutional question. And the Supreme Court once again severed the issues. My lady, I also need to know whether you were part of the panel in the uh, Quaison case that granted the injunction. Uh, I listed them. I was. Oh, I am. I'm building a point. In that case also, my lady, the validity of election, someone's eligibility as a member of parliament was challenged, isn't it? Yes. And this was around the time parliament was considering a 
particular legislation on ELA, isn't it? Uh, no. We, 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 I can't remember the exact month the E-Levy issue came up, but that was last year or so. Yes. I, 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 I remember sitting on the E-Levy matter, but that's a, that was last year. That matter is not concluded. That matter is not concluded, obviously. It's my information. Do, do you have an idea when that matter will be concluded? Don't you advise you with that? What are you talking about? When the plaintiffs prosecute the case. Allow, 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 allow. Lady. In the last week, there was a Supreme Court decision on Quaysen's case. Obviously, from what we've seen as part of the judgment, we were part of the panel. Correct. Yes, yes. I've said so. Will it be wrong for me to say that? the Supreme Court invalidated the parliamentary elections in that sense, no. no. That invalidation was done by the High Court last year. Yeah. Was it last year? We are in 2023. I think the High Court's determination was in 2021. It concluded in 2021. Then there were appeal proceedings, etc. And Eddie, the, our major concern has to do with the, we in the minority, our major concern. Minority. Emanate from the fact that we don't have the reason ruling out for us to be able to ask you questions as to the reason why you arrived together with the panel at that conclusion. He's referring to a majority of Ghanaians. We have been informed that the court, the Supreme Court of Ghana, will give the reason ruling on the 7th of January, of June 2020. Now that we do not have the ruling, well, and the fact that we want to have actual questions on it, how do you suggest, what do you suggest? We do. I think, I think one um, Honorable Afenyam Markin has drawn my attention to the need for the Supreme Court to appreciate the effect of any delay in giving out the reasons when it comes to politically sensitive cases. I can assure you that we deal with every case the way we deal with every case. And, and so in this particular case, I think earlier on in the day, I said that because we are a seven member panel, we work in a particular way. And I said I had taken note of his concerns. Justice Gertrude Arabe Sabasaki. I need to find out from you if you are aware of the Baba Jama case as well. Ah. I, I am aware of it from the books. Yes. Are you aware that in the same Baba Jama case, the Supreme Court ruled that they do not have jurisdiction, and it's the High Court that will have the jurisdiction? They will not have to. You know, I I think the point has to be made clear. Different courts have different jurisdictions over different matters. The Supreme Court is the only court that has jurisdiction to interpret the Constitution, where there is the different interpretations are being placed on it by disputing parties. So our jurisdiction that is exercised under our constitutional interpretation jurisdiction is different from the jurisdiction that's exercised by a different court under its peculiar jurisdiction. 
It's important not to mix it. Lady, yesterday I received a letter from the Office of the Attorney General and the Minister of Justice. The letter was addressed to the Right Honorable Speaker, Parliament of Ghana, Accra, and I was in copied as the Minority Leader. The letter seeks to inform Parliament about the recent ruling on Kwesi. The letter, the third paragraph says that on the 17th of May 2023, the Supreme Court delivered judgment in the suit and granted the following reliefs. And there are five reliefs. Since you are aware of the reliefs, there's no need for me to read all of them. But let me read the last one, the last relief. It goes on to say that finally, Parliament is ordered to expound the name of the first defend defendant, James Jache Kwesi, as a member of Parliament for Assen North. The third paragraph in the second page reads, the effect of this judgment of the Supreme Court is that the election of Mr. James Jache Kwesi as a member of Parliament for Assen North constituency is unconstitutional, no void, and of no legal effect. The final order of the Supreme Court for Parliament to expound the name of Mr. James Jache Kwesi as a member of Parliament for Assen North means, means that Parliament is to completely remove any record relating to him as a member of parliament and implies that a vacancy has occurred in relation to that same North constituency. My question is, how does parliament challenge Honorable Kwesi's name from Hansard, for instance, that has already been published? How does parliament, for instance, Go back and let's count their chain name from both in proceedings or all parliamentary documents that have been distributed across the world. Don't you think that the meaning, the meaning that the Attorney General, the AG, has enlightened in the document before us will be very difficult to implement. What are your views I will not, not be able to give you my views on what the Attorney General has said. So, can I put it this way? The Attorney General, in his view, has explained the meaning of your faith relief. Do you agree with the Attorney General's Minimum to the faith relief as in your judgment, or what is the meaning of the faith relief in your judgment? Could you kindly read the faith relief? The faith relief says that finally, Parliament is ordered to expound the name of the first defendant, James the Chief Quason as a member of parliament for Assembly. That is what it means. That is what it means. That's what it means. Madam, um, so if you say as pounch, is it going forward or all the records that he has been involved in? It's perspective. All of members order. Can we allow you know, the decision? All of members, can I have some order, please? Any decision of the Supreme Court is a decision of the court, and it is also allowable for any party who does not understand what the court has said to seek clarification from the court. 
So I would humbly suggest that if there's anything in our record you don't understand, that you activate the procedures. But otherwise, I don't know what else to say. Madam, we will wait for the ruling, um, the detailed ruling, and we'll ask further questions on this matter. But let me also ask this question. Let me also ask this question. As a layman, I'm very uncomfortable any time I see the Supreme Court itself calling individual persons before the court for contempt. To me, it appears to be the court is acting as one complainant, two prosecutor, and three a judge. I want to know what is the practice in other jurisdictions so that I'll be guided by that. This, this is the nature of the contempt relief. A, a party can bring an action before a court for contempt if the party finds that the, another one is not obeying the court's orders. Then the court itself can commit for contempt when the contempt is carried out in the face of the court. So the, there are different ways in which that application or that relief can be obtained from a court. A court is supposed to protect the dignity of the administration of justice. Some Ghanaians believe that this is an abuse of power. Can you explain to those concerned Ghanaians that for some reason they believe that this is an abuse of power, that it is not an abuse of power, in your view? To, to be honest, it is not an abuse of power, you see. The, the judicial process is integral to the peace of a country. Honorable member, the judicial process is integral to the peace of a country. And that is why I believe even this relief it constitutes part of the processes that may be commenced by a court itself. It's not an abuse, and 